Pat Cummins, welcome to 7.30. And I'm going to start by going back to that incredible World Cup in India. Cricket, as we know, is like a religion there. Um, their players are like gods. Can you describe what it's like living in that incredible pressure over a long tournament? It's crazy. Um, it's always when families or friends come in for the first time, they can't believe, you know, a thousand people waiting outside the hotel for the team bus on the way to the ground or fans in their Indian jersey walking the street every day of the week, um, cheering for every single ball that happens in a cricket match, not just boundaries. So I think sometimes we get a little bit immune to it, but when you step back and hear other people's stories, you're like, oh, okay, this is unlike anywhere else in the world. This is wild. Now, go, I want to go to the final. It's one of the biggest sporting cauldrons in the world. There's 100,000 people, more or less, in the crowd expecting to be cheering India as the champions, what's going through your head as you walk onto the pitch? This is a once in a lifetime opportunity. So whatever happens today, this is a special day. Um, I, you know, try to soak it all in. It's just a sea of blue. It's not like a AFL crowd where there might be people just wearing casual clothes. Everyone's wearing the blue Indian jersey. Um, and I'm just thinking this would be really satisfying if we shut them all up basically <laughs> if we hear a silence that's going to be satisfying but the enormity of it um, sunk in when we were in that cauldron now speaking of silence I want to go to one of the one of the big moments which is of course Virat Kohli is their greatest hope the great Indian batsman I think he's averaging a hundred at that stage in the tournament he is of course a massive threat to Australia's chances of winning what was going through your head when he chopped the ball onto his stumps? Uh, no, first of all, just one wicket closer to kind of where we wanted to get to. Um, he was playing quite fluidly. Um, so I just thought, you know, you beauty, get someone else in. And then I think the enormity of it kind of sunk in a little bit after when you, the crowd was just silent. And you saw, you know, Vera hung around for a little while, kind of hanging his head and just disbelief. Um, and he's just a class player. He drags him out of trouble so many times. So with him gone, I was like, OK, we're one step closer. Um, now, already by that stage, you had definitely shocked the pundits by deciding not to go into bat when you won the toss. And for anybody watching who doesn't follow cricket, it's an extremely rare decision. Now, I've heard a few things about that that you said it was because of the dew that was going to come onto the ground later or because of the black soil that was going to turn into a hard-baked pitch. What was the reason for making that decision? I think those two are part, part of the reasons. Um, yeah, it's funny in cricket, there's lots of conventional wisdom which doesn't really line up with um, results, you know. So the conventional wisdom is you've got a bat in a final. Um, whereas, you know, I think the last five ODI finals have been won by the team bowling first, same in T20 cricket, the T20 World Cup finals. Um, so, yeah, I, I kind of went a bit of gut feel, thought it was going to get, thought it was going to be a bit of a tricky wiki, wicket during the day. Um, so kind of put the pressure on them to set whatever total they think is a good wicket and just back ourselves to chase it down when maybe the wicket's a little bit better at night. And of course it paid off. Now there is, as you referred to, there is a lot of conventional wisdom in cricket, including that bowlers couldn't be captains. But I think I'm more interested in how you manage conventional wisdom, that you've reached a point where you knew there'd be lots of questions around that decision not to go into bat. How did you arrive at a position where you trust yourself that that gut feeling is right? Oh, I'm never alone. Um, so of course you sound out other people. Um, uh, you know, there's analytics these days that obviously help, but we've got an experienced group of players and staff who uh, are there every day. Um, so, you know, we bounce these off off each other, um, think, okay, what's going to bring the best out of our side? And, and that's nine, 99 times over 100 what, what guides our decision as opposed to what, um, you know, other people might think. And did... Was there general agreement that that was the right decision or do you have to, in the end, say, I'm the captain, I'm, I'm going with this? Uh, this one was, yeah, general, yeah. Um, yeah everyone was pretty, pretty sure it just felt like a bowling day. Um, What's a bowling day? 
yeah, it just felt like the wicket was a bit dry. Perhaps it was going to be harder to score runs during the day. Um, whereas a lot of the other games for the tournament um, at different venues than Ahmedabad, under lights at night, the ball zipped around. So it felt like a better time to bat during the day. And the rest is the rest is a really magnificent history. You did when you became captain very early on. You you I I saw that you had said at at the very beginning it 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 is a burden. It's a lot to think about rather than just focusing on your bowling. And you wondered for a moment, I think, whether or not it was something that you would flourish at. What's changed since then that makes you able to do both things? to be a world-class bowler and a world-class captain? I think just trusting, um, you know, particularly preparation. Um, you know, before I became captain, I didn't really have the flying hours behind me, whereas now a couple of years in, um, you, well, I trust myself that when I'm out there, I can work things out on the fly and your, your intuition's got better over a couple of years. And um, Whereas, you know, when I first started, I probably didn't have as big a gut feel in you you're trying to over plan and overthink things before they actually happen so um, I think that releases some of the pressure and you know leading to games of course it's preparation you do some some planning but it's I can just worry about me as a bowler and making sure my skills are right and then trust me once I get out there the captaincy can take over when it needs to you've also I don't know whether you always had this but um, you've you've clearly learnt how to enable other people to play at their best I'm thinking of Travis Head's innings when he came back he'd had difficult form at the Gabba and he says you put your arm around him and just said go out and play your game you know what you're doing what words to that effect did you have to learn how to bring the team along with you or has that always been part of your game I you know I've been playing for over a decade now and you know what brings us the best out of yourself and that's not a cookie cutter approach to different players um, everyone needs something a little bit different so you know, I always try and put myself in their shoes and what's going to bring the best out of them as a player. And I think back to conventional wisdom, you know, we don't want everyone to be the same player. That'd be, one, it wouldn't be, you know, I, I think the best team, but two, it'd be boring. <laughs> we want characters, we want people playing different styles. Um, so, you know, conventional wisdom, someone like Trav Head, if he gets caught out deep, that's a bad shot. Well, you know, if you nick off to a block, you're still out. So we just want to encourage him to play his way, um, put the percentages in his favour, and we don't really care how it looks. I remember Ricky Ponting, I mean, sorry, Steve Smith saying that about batting, you know, develop your own style. But moving on, I, I contacted David Pocock this morning to ask him about you, obviously another sporting great and someone you've worked with on climate change initiatives. So I asked him what his view of you was, and he said this. He said, he is a leader for the times. He manages to be a great bloke under a huge amount of pressure. It should give Australians a bit of extra pride to have him representing us. A leader for our times, is that how you see yourself? Uh, I mean, yeah, Dave, that's great to hear from Dave, who's seen a lot. Um, he's obviously a huge leader um, himself, so. Um, yeah, I don't know, it's probably not for me to say. I just try and be myself every day and um, you know, I really enjoy the role of working with other people and trying to bring the best out of them. Um, so that's, yeah, it's great to hear. I think the point he's making about a leader for our times is that you know how to lead in a contemporary era where there are issues at play as well as cricket. Um, did you know that about yourself before you became captain, that you would be able to embrace all of these ideas along with elite sport? I think you know, becoming you know, an adult growing up, you start forming your how you see the world differently to maybe how you were as a kid and you start thinking for yourself and um, yeah ma maybe it's kind of more prevalent when you're a captain and you're more in the public eye um, but you know I don't think it's anything new I think there's always there's always issues in the world that always have been it's just perhaps these issues and how they dealt with are a little bit differently to how they were 20 30 40 years ago you've started an organization um, on climate for cricket what are you trying to achieve with that a, a few things um, you know I guess the overarching idea is actually to try and help grassroots cricket um, so by um, you know initially we put solar panels on cricket clubs around Australia um, and that was to save clubs from some 
money that they could then put into junior programs, female programs, um, just saving clubs money. So that, that was kind of one part of it. And I think another one, uh, was probably two more parts. One's just decarbonising, doing our, our bit. You know, cricket's got a big carbon footprint. Um, it takes a lot. So trying to offset a little bit of that. And thirdly, I think it's a great place to encourage conversation around these topics. Um, you know, I grew up in Penrith and we put solar panels in my home cricket club out there. And it's probably not your traditional area that you see old blokes sitting around talking about how good the money savings on their <laughs> their roofs. Um, yeah, so I think it's there's a lot of positives that's been had through that program and uh, something I'm really proud of. There was an inevitable backlash to your positions on climate change and on Black Lives Matter. I think you were part of the team that took the knee uh, in the West Indies. A woke, far-left, climate catastrophist clown were amongst the things that were said. Now, you must have expected this. Is it just water off a duck's back or does it ever make you think you shouldn't be so public? It definitely makes you stop and think. Um, you know, with with this role, it's got such a large scale in terms of the amount of people that um, have an opinion on anything you do. Um, so even if it's 90% are with you, that 10% is still a lot of people. Um, so it definitely makes you stop and think. Um, but again, it, it, I think it, it makes you think, um, double think, you know, how... If, if what you're doing and how you're going about it's the right way and it either makes you change or if anything it's probably has emboldened some of my views and that this is a good thing it's um you know if i don't stay strong in this and 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 i pander to you know a loud minority um that that's not a good thing so it's 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 no bad thing that after coming under criticism, you then went on to retain the Ashes and win the World Cup. So there is that too, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. You are human after all. Yeah. Um, but so much of sporting greatness, you know, as well as the elite physical strength, is the ability to have psychological strength and focus. Does the noise and the criticism ever get inside your head? I think you'd be lying if you said it, it doesn't. Um, I think you've got to find ways to manage it, just like you manage your body um, as a professional athlete. So at times you, you know, wind it up when you feel like you need a little bit of extra mo motivation, and other times when it's not servicing your purpose, you try and shut it out as best as you can. Um, but it's it's part of the job. You you you're not on an island. You you can't just say oh, I want to play cricket in front of millions of people, but also I don't want anyone to have an opinion on me. That's it's not it's not what we sign up for. So. It's something you get better better at the longer you play, um, and I always come back to as long as I know I've got great relationships with teammates, family. They know, know who I am. I know who I am. Outside noise is just that. I should have added that the voice to parliament referendum was also one of the things that you spoke out about. I just wonder, would you ever consider going into politics? Follow David Pocock's lead. <laughs> uh, I mean, you never say never, but probably not. No, I, yeah. I'll leave that to, to David and lots of other wonderful people. Plenty of cricket left in you yet, so we're, <laughs> not, we're not trying to get you to move on, believe yeah. me. Um, what you're talking about there, though, is a set of values and a way of thinking about the world. How much of that comes from your parents? A lot. Uh, yeah, family, parents. Um, you know, I grew up in a big family, five kids, um, and mum and dad who have always been very community-minded and... Um, you know, I think in a big family, you get knocked down a peg or two as soon as you get too big for your boots as well. Um, but yeah, that's been part of our childhood. Um, you know, mum and dad both very curious people, always trying to you know remind us that we're one how lucky we are to live in this country and have all the opportunities that we have, but also how um, you know we're just one small little part in a very big world and make sure we um, yeah open our eyes. Um, there was a very very sweet moment when you had to leave the test series in India to go back come back to Australia where your mother was ill um, during that very difficult time one of the Barmy army played a tribute to her played Maria on his trumpet was she able to see that 
Yeah, yeah, I played that for her mum and she loved it. Yeah, it was a really special moment. I mean, it's, it shows what great sport can do. Um, you know, little moments that mean so much and um, cricket's been a big part of our family forever and to see, I guess, you know, the, the respect and love shown from our oldest rivals, um, yeah, it was a really special moment. Especially after the summer, but um, I was thinking about you in India then for the, the World Cup. Obviously, she's passed away since then and our condolences. Um, you know, she watched you play as a little boy in the backyard and you're having one of the biggest triumphs it's possible for an Australian cricketer to have. How much was she present during that tournament? Yeah, I mean, yeah, a lot, you know, think about her every day. Um, and yeah, fortunately she's seen a lot of successes before this year. And um, yeah, she's a huge part of who I am. And um, yeah, I'm hoping and I'm sure she would have been really proud. Well, she must have been, as we are. Congratulations on an incredible win and whatever is to come, we'll be following. Pat Cummins, thank you very much. Thanks very much. Cheers.